I mean, there's a room literally through that door over there. Um, What's in the room? That room we call the dungeon. I don't like it. What's in it? Old fridge, an old microwave. And it's just an echoey stone room. Okay. No uh, chains or straps of any kind. Adrian, I'm asexual. Why would there be chains and straps there? I don't know. You could be a serial killer. <laughs> it's entirely possible. <laughs> I don't know you like that. <laughs> so, you remember how I was like, oh, that's a really great place to start. And the next thing, I don't remember what that was. What was that? New England authors. Um... The indie or New, Zealand, New Zealand having a preference for historical or contemporary books for their New Zealand authors over fantasy. So here's <clears throat> here's the interesting thing. At the convention I was just at this last weekend, eight out of ten authors there to sell books were romance authors. Eight out of the ten readers that we got cycling through during the author reader events eight out of ten of those were sci-fi fantasy readers the majority of, of the authors were romance the majority of the readers were sci-fi fantasy and i and i just don't know what to make of that in in the context of this event so is is do you think there might be a similar thing going on over there where the market thinks it there's it thinks things are one way but they're actually another yeah, it's it's very likely. Um, I think, um, yeah, just because like a lot of those contemporary and historical um, books as well, they're from like a very strong representation point of view. So they're either about um, like, of course, historical events um, or modern focus, but it's often like with a focus on very local things or like indigenous culture or um, Pacifica culture. Cause we've got a, um, I think we've got like this after of course the Pacific islands, we've got like the highest Pacific population I think in New Zealand. And because they're basically our neighbors, we like support them a lot in that sort of sphere. But that yeah, I, uh, but yeah, just because, you know, of my background, even though like where I grew up with, I was surrounded by a bunch of different cultures. That is not a story for me to tell. So I tell the fantasy stories because I also find them more exciting. Yeah. It also, you know, provides a, a an opportunity to create new cultures and new dynamics between them and it's interesting when you're surrounded by so many different cultures or part of different cultures what you can do creatively with that in storytelling you know what i mean mm -hmm. like i mean for example i was you know I, I work at a hotel and uh we had a family checking in during a very very busy day they had two of our biggest suites and neither of them were uh done being cleaned yet housekeeping was falling behind so they had to wait for housekeeping to finish cleaning the room so they're just standing in the lobby in front of me and i mean there's like 20 of them you know so it's chaos uh they were a half latino half uh arabic family hmm. which i had never seen myself i am hispanic so the women were all speaking to each other in Spanish and I could understand everything they were saying. The men were speaking to each other all in Arabic. I could not understand anything they were saying. And they were communicating with each other with a mix of both languages. It was very fascinating to watch because I have that with Spanish and English with my family, but I've never seen it with mm. Spanish and Arabic and English, like all three of those mixed in together because they were fluent in all three. Anyway, the mom you know there's grandmas and there is there's aunts and there's the kids but the mom was talking mad trash about me the entire time because the room was already so she's talking trash in spanish 
about how bad I am at my job, how they're not coming back here because this is ridiculous and you know it's, uh, they have to wait. This is absurd. And just, just talking mad, mad trash in Spanish. And I'm listening to the entire thing. They, When they came in, they spoke to me in English, so I spoke to them in English. They, they gave me no reason to reveal that, that I speak Spanish. So I mm. didn't. And so uh, I just let her carry on. So she And she's been going on for a while. Then a completely different guest who had absolutely nothing to do with them. She just happened to be Hispanic herself. She took one look at my hair and correctly pegged me for a Hispanic person and started speaking to me in Spanish at the desk. So I spoke to her in Spanish. And when I replied to that lady in Spanish, the one that was talking trash about me screamed at like, like she, <laughs> like someone had screamed. Grabbed it. Like screamed and, and was like, why did you, in Spanish, she said to me, why didn't you tell me you spoke Spanish? And I look at her and I said, because now I know what you really think of me. And so does everybody around you. And all her family's like, ooh. <laughs> she was like so embarrassed. I'm like, yeah, it's embarrassing, isn't it? It really sucks when it's <laughs> So like, it was really uh. like, it just felt really good. But it's one of those things that it, it's, it's a cultural, like, bridge that happens there then because for the rest of her stay that lady loved me she would stop by the desk and say the sweetest things about me and bring me little treats and stuff from their their parties and everything and i'm just like i'm not gonna forget that you were just like the meanest <laughs> so that's all something that i can infuse into like new culture interactions in my fictional stories you know what i mean like it all makes it in there mm. like does that happen with with you with like where like these these interactions that you have with people end up in those stories just you know tweak <laughs> <laughs> i don't think specifically because like I mean, just because I can't think of a better term, but a lot of the time, like, growing up and, like, when I was very little, you could almost say that, like, I didn't see color. I know it's a bad phrase to use, but that's probably, like, the closest well, when that you're, I could Well, when you're get. a kid, you really don't. You know what I mean? Like, not like that. Yeah. Like, when you're a kid, and I guess... You don't understand the yeah. cultural undertones of skin color. You don't get that yet. That's learned over time. Sorry, yeah, and then because I was surrounded by that growing up and I guess like had a more comprehensive education um, surrounding like the different cultures that were around me, largely through social studies in high school, I think, because social studies in high school delved a lot into like the social issues throughout modern history. Um, and I think from that, because that was the class I also learned about the KKK through uh, and stuff like that. KKK and slave trade and all those things it's allowed me to like appreciate like the way that I observe um like other people of color and like cherish the other cultures that they have and then it it was kind of weird because then for the longest time I thought like gosh I don't have a culture I'm just a white blob floating around this school. And then when I go into university, that study was um, dived into the further when they said, well, actually, you do have a culture. You just don't see it because it is the dominant culture. You have the normal culture. So it's widely yeah. accepted in your area as the normal culture. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, like, that's yeah. fascinating because I was watching... Um, this show the white lotus i don't know if you've ever seen it. it's on hbo um i i'm like maybe three or four episodes in i can't bring myself to watch it more often because it's about hotels and it gives me like ptsd to watch it <laughs> but uh so in this uh in this one episode this uh this character this young lady is uh you know uh seeing one of the what they call cabana boys one of the one of the, the employees of the hotel mm -hmm. and uh he is indigenous to the island that they are on you know and this hotel came and stole a bunch of land from the people and you know there's doing the the greedy thing that that you know these big companies do and he having lost his home 
and needing to provide for his family has to work at the hotel that took his home away from him. You know what I mean? It's like really messed up. And, um, and it's interesting because he said that some really interesting scenes where he's talking to this girl who's there on vacation. She's not from the island. She doesn't know about this stuff. And he's educating her on everything that happened there and and uh, the differences between his indigenous culture from that island and the culture of everybody else who's just there visiting. And that night at dinner, you know, she's sitting at dinner with her friends and family and they bring out these guys to do the indigenous like dance of their people and it was this really like intense scene because like you know you're at dinner at a hotel and they bring out some dudes in grass skirts or whatever who start doing you know doing the flames and the dance and the chanting and everything and you're like oh great they're putting on a show but she had a completely different context for it she had she was looking at it from a completely different lens of this dude is having to do this he's being forced to perform his people's dance for all these rich white people who just want to sit here and like watch you know what i mean like it's really weird and like messed up because on the other hand the people watching the show they don't know they they don't know that there's all this like weird tension in this situation all they know is look at this beautiful dance that these beautiful people are putting on for us you know how lovely and we're getting to learn about them and appreciate their culture like there there's no malice in them sitting there and watching it and yet it's like such a messed up moment you know what i mean it's it, it's it's yeah. a really interesting situation you know yeah a lot of like tourism in that sense just like feels like orientalism i guess where it's just showing off like the shiny the aesthetically <laughs> pleasing things about a culture and not necessarily like the true like cultural experience it's just yeah. like these are the things that are going to sell more money and get talked about more so that's what we're going to show you yeah it's it's a big flashy show they have dances and fire and stuff the people will love it and it's like you're not really thinking about like the impact that you're having on the performers let alone the people that live here it's like it's really interesting odd and you know again from that whole side of like the folks that are not doing it maliciously they're sitting there enjoying a show you know there's there's like there's i've seen videos of like dudes who dress up in in a a different cultures you know garb Mm -hmm. and ask a bunch of other white people if it's offensive and all the white people are like yes that's very offensive that you know and then they go to that neighborhood and ask those actual people what they think and they love it because they're like you you know you're you're showing us love you're wearing our our stuff like we're we're over here wearing your stuff you wear our stuff and that's great and it feels you know like we're sharing our cultures with each other yeah (laughs) that yeah that kind of stuff is weird i remember yeah further studying that in university like the concept of cultural appropriation. Like, quite often everybody thinks that cultural appropriation is bad. But cultural appropriation also is an umbrella term for the good kinds of cultural appropriation, like um, a cultural trade. That was like the main example where it's like, you take something from our culture, and then we are going to take something similar from yours. Like not like a stealing situation, but like we yeah, no, it's a, yeah, it's an it's, it's, like, it's an exchange, an interchange, in yeah, yeah, and that's like a good form of cultural appropriation. But like everybody just thinks that because you're taking something from another culture and like putting your own spin on it, that it's bad. Like I think the main example these days is like a lot of the music videos um, that circle around and like. Um, this is probably like, what, seven years ago now? Maybe more? Could even be 10, gosh. But like, I distinctly remember um, in the Dark Horse music video by Katy Perry, this is something that we studied as well. Um, like, she's surrounded by like this very aesthetically pleasing Egyptian culture of making a theme surrounding it, which that's kind of weird in of itself. But the thing that really caught fire is that in the music video, there's like this sphinx with laser eyes that destroys all of Katy Perry's suitors in the music video. And one of them was wearing the symbol of Allah, 
and the symbol of Allah in the process of the laser firing got destroyed. And that caused like a lot of fire where they had to go back and yeah. edit that out of the music video. So like, that's yeah. like the bad appropriation. Um, the whole Egyptian representation, that's sort of like a middle ground because it's like, it would make sense if there was like actual Egyptian elements present in the song or you were like making comparisons to Egyptian culture. But because it doesn't relate to the actual Dark Horse song, that's where it sort of gets shifty and into that like a morally gray appropriation territory. Yeah, it's weird. There's there's definitely like shades to the whole thing. There's uh, that mm. comedian Bill Burr. Uh, he's one of my favorites, and he has a, a bit about uh, how he was watching a documentary about Elvis with his wife. Bill Burr is white, his wife is black, and they're watching this documentary about Elvis, and, uh, and, and she is getting angrier and angrier at all the subtle racism that her husband, Bill, is missing. Like, it's just going over his head because he's watching it as a white guy. And so... Mm -hmm. They start discussing it, and you know he gets uh, a little upset that uh, that you know black culture is upset with Elvis for stealing their their music and you know not not giving any credit to where it came from. And he's like, well, you know, like people saying that he took leg shaking, like like if you see another person do that and then you start doing it. How is that any different from Elvis? You know what I mean? Like, what's the big, what's the big deal? She's like, no, it's not about that. It's about his tech, the music. He didn't give so much as a shout out to what came before. He's called the king of it now. All that stuff. And she's making a great case, and he's like, okay, I, I get it. He appropriated a culture. You're, you're right. However, I don't get mad when you hop on a skateboard and start riding around. It's like, hey man, stop appropriating my culture. Some dirty white kid in Santa Monica came up with that, man. And 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 it's this incredibly like interesting point where it's like, no, you're right. We do like exchange pieces of our culture with each other all the time. And isn't that a greater uh, uh, representation of love? Than, than keeping everybody apart you know what i mean yeah like, let's learn about each other like have you ever seen a white dude like really excited that he got invited to the cookout like those dudes understand oh there's a whole world of exchange here that you know i i, I haven't i've been missing out on like we there's more love to be had there's more love to be had yeah and I think it's just like that whole weird thing of like the people who want to divide and then the people who want to embrace. It's yeah. just such a crazy thing. It comes down to respect, you know, you're being respectful of each other, you know, you're holding each other accountable. And as long as those two things are happening, man, like it's all love. Like, you know, it's all love. Let's 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 share and share alike. Uh okay. How is the writing of book two going? Because I know I've read a couple of chapters. I'm not very, as far into it as I wish I was. I'm going to get back into it, but I'm loving it so far. But how far are you into it? Where are you? Yeah, I'm kind of in a similar situation. Um, there was like a solid two weeks where I didn't like edit it or add it, add anything to like the CP um, documents. Oh, so I you're guess. like a real author. Okay, I got you. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just because, like, a lot of real, like, crazy things start happening on my end in regards to, like, work-life balance and mental health. And so that stuff had to go on the back burner for a little bit, and it's still on the back burner now, but, like, slowly, like, slipping off. The back burner back into my hands. Um, <laughs> Careful, it's hot. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I think I will still be on track to like align with where I want to be in terms of my goals because I wanted to start beta reading um, at the end of this year, which is still very possible. Like, I don't want to finish the beta reading at the end of this year. I want to just started because I know like now or I'm starting to get used to now the kind of paces that I can make essentially yeah 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 you know the good thing about those long like beta reader phases though is that you can get some some other projects started and 
into a good position before you you dive back into the one that you're working on now. Yeah, absolutely. Get a nice conveyor so, belt of stories going, you know. Yeah, then I guess like I want to be able to like. I mean, it would be good to have like by NaNoWriMo um, November month because I'll be working on a different project then. That may be a good time to start the beta reading, but yeah. At the same time, I'm also weary about the beta reading process because with my first book, the beta reading process was a nightmare. And so I'm hoping it's less of a nightmare this time around. I have to pay you a compliment on your opening chapter for book two because I, I haven't read book one and I go into the second one uh, just trusting that uh, you'd, you'd hold my hand through it as, as the author. And, and I was really, really impressed with how well you started because yes, it's a sequel. So you're starting it from a new point and you want people who already read the first book to you know dive right in and get hooked right away. And at the same time, you have to you know kind of fill in first time readers on what happened before. But you also want to like create some mystery about it. Like you don't want to just spill out exposition dump everything that happened. You oh, want so to give them little nuggets. That. No, the, the, and and you did a really good. That's what I'm trying to say. You did a really good job because what you do is you drop these little nuggets of like this happened and that happened and this person is important to me because of this. And all it does is like, oh man, now I I, I want to find out what happened there why did, did these two become such enemies and why did the oh like how did this person save the other person i know that he saved them but how how and from what and why and like oh it just makes me want to read it awesome. i know exactly okay. the characters and the moments that you're talking about and i <laughs> yes <laughs> well you did write it <laughs> <laughs> Like you could like drop the most obscure hint and I'll probably be able to like get it. Like <laughs> Well, you know, it's like by the time that you're you're done working on a on a book and putting it out, what I've learned from this first one is that you've read it like a, a million times from cover to cover. You know, like you no one has read that book more than you. No one will ever have read that book more. Than you. Until I get a super fan who ends up reading that book once every year. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> then they'll definitely read it more times than me. I haven't like fully gone through book one and read it since I published it. Because mm. I think times when I've like flicked through just to find something, then like I find the typos or like the inconsistencies that I missed, and I'm just like, oh god, the entire book's like this, but it's probably not. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's. Uh... For me, through uh, draft to digital, I'm allowed to make uh, changes to the uh, to the book uh, once every ninety days without like incurring any fees or anything. So uh, I, I'm working on an edit right now to like put out like a new edition, basically, because after literally like seconds after hitting the publish button on that novel, I found a typo that I missed, and I was like, mother. And like early too, like chapter three, like really early on, and I'm like, Jesus, like, is it like this through the whole book? And come to find out, it is. It, it, it was just riddled with typos and and, uh, and stuff that I would much rather fix. So that, along with a scene that apparently is not uh, 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 being interpreted the way that I intended, and I'm like, you know what, I, I'm going to need to rewrite that scene and, and make it a little clearer what I'm trying to do because I don't want it to be misconstrued. So I'm actually like. You know george lucasing this thing and <laughs> fixing little things about it and uh and republishing it when it's done so i'll have read the book once more by the time that's done all right let's see what else amy what is your favorite non-marvel non-dc superhero thing whether it's a show a movie a comic uh uh manga what is your favorite non-marvel specifically thing. relating to superheroes uh... yeah yeah or anything with superpowers really like you know like Dragon Ball Z is not superheroes but it is you know what I mean <laughs> um I guess that would be um Bridget Kemmerer's Elemental series so Bridget Kemmerer she's most famed for writing um 
like a fantasy romance series called A Curse So Dark and Lonely, but before that she wrote a contemporary um, fantasy with romance elements in it. And it basically revolves around this family of four brothers, and each of them controls a different element. And it just goes through their story of um, surviving in a town that hates them. And then they also, you know, find love along the way. All right. Nice. That sounds awesome. That sounds yeah. awesome. Uh, Chronicle was one of mine. We already talked about that on the other yes. show. That's definitely something to check out. Um, other than that, uh, it's probably Invincible. There's a, a comic, and now it's a cartoon on, uh, what is it on? Prime? Amazon Prime. Invincible. It's written by Robert Kirkman, who uh, is famous for creating The Walking Dead. Um, he basically uh, creates created this uh, superhero series where the idea is like, okay, it's kind of like the boys in the idea of like, what if superheroes were real, you know? Mm. It would be a much more gruesome thing than, than people portray in Marvel and DC because like if Superman can punch a hole in your chest there's and other characters can do that somebody's getting punched a hole through their chest like that's going to happen you know what I mean like it gets brutal so like that so mm -hmm. uh, but it's also at the same time a young like teenage superhero starting out you know what I mean so like you have this kind of like Spider-Man Nightwing aged kind of character and then this epic journey ahead of him all through adulthood and it's it's uh it's an epic superhero tale it's, it's freaking awesome and and a whole unique universe that also makes a lot of fun of the marvel and dc universes you know it has little references that make it ridiculous in it. you gotta love it for that kind of thing nice. i recommend it. amy oh, wait. i can't believe i didn't save the incredibles I oh, that's Incredibles. another good one. Oh, The Incredibles is a good answer. Damn it, that's a really good one. Where's my super suit? Yeah. Honey! <laughs> Where is my super suit? My super suit! suit. <laughs> Why I, uh, do you need I'll to put know? It away. <laughs> oh, I love that scene. Um, you, you know what's funny about that? And, and we'll, we'll start closing out with this. Uh, that scene uh, in The Incredibles, he's inside the building when uh, a helicopter crashes into the building from outside his window. And in Avengers Infinity War, Sam Jackson is on the street looking up as a helicopter crashes into a building's window. <laughs> I did not know that. And it's like, he's in both places right now. Uh, so <laughs> that's a fun little connection. Um, Amy, was there anything that you wanted to cover with us today on the Writer's Den that we didn't get a chance to get to, that I didn't think of to ask, or that you forgot about? Anything that you uh, want to make sure you get out there to the people before we wrap up? Not off the top of my head, but... All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I'm here to mind. I thought that the Writer's Den went really well today. I, I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, I did it enjoy nice it. Thank episode. you. Yeah, it was a nice, fun little episode. I love being able to like spotlight a singular author every now and then like that. It's fun. You know, we, we do the Tuber Book Club and, and we do the the big like round table typewriters podcast. But those one on one these one on one interviews. Like I, I really like these. These are fun, you know? Get to really know a person. Yeah, absolutely. It's good times. Uh you got anything coming up? Anything you wanna plug before we wrap up? Uh, uh, an appearance I need to plug in my phone because its battery is dying. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, then, in that case, let's go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, I have been Adrian Santiago. She has been Amy Rosenfeld. And uh, please buy our books and do all the things. Subscribe to the channels. And uh, we will see you guys next week. Uh, what am I doing next week? Next week is not to Rear Book Club. And it is not Writer's Den. So I th oh, next week is the book release party for David Hopkins. He is we putting love a book out, release party. Uh, yes, he is putting out The Dryad's Crown 
finally uh and uh it's it's an incredibly gorgeous cover and i can't wait to talk to him and his editor and his cover artist and we're gonna give out books so be here next tuesday 4 p.m east no actually it's uh later than that it's 7 p.m eastern standard time so uh for you that's a little uh, later in the morning for you that's that's uh not quite so unreasonable you might be able to be there with us <laughs> Not quite so reasonable, yes. <laughs> All right, y'all. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we'll catch you guys next week. Right on, writers. We are out. Cause I'm a red fly for the fight. Yeah, I'm here to get it. I got drive, got sight. Always have a vision. I go by the night. I be in my feelings. I'm a big fight.